How? Defense attack. Ow! Hey, welcome back to Find and Fix and Race Them. We're finally almost to the racing part. I'm pretty excited about that. A little nervous, I always get a little nervous about racing, but we're finally to the racing part. We're gonna be going to a place called Sparky's MX Park. It's in Blythe, California, and taking the Can-Am out um, tomorrow. Um, one thing I wanted to say to you, you, hey, if you're watching this and you've been watching the channel, and you're not subscribed, maybe give it a little subscribe click button. 97% of people that watch the channel or watch my videos are not subscribed. So if you watch it and you enjoy it, just click the subscribe thing on your uh, whatever device that you're uh, using, but on YouTube, obviously. Um, and you know, it helps out the channel. We're gonna go um, do some racing, hopefully this weekend on the Can-Am. I do have a few things I need to get taken care of on it um, before um, I uh, head out. And this is kind of, a, I'm gonna be doing a few things today and bringing you along for that. Um, one thing was, so I got some brakes. I, 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 I talked to a guy and I was trying to get, he, I found somebody that could reline my brake shoes or put new shoes on them and he said, um, he happened to have a set for a Can-Am in stock on his shelf. And I don't know, maybe someone can tell me in the comments, but um, did the old Can-Ams have this kind of leading shoe, following shoe kind of thing where there was a big space where there was no shoe? Because I thought this was a, it had fallen off, to be honest. But now that I really look at it, it is chamfered on this edge like it is chamfered on this edge. So I feel like this literally, there is a trading and a leading shoe or there was on this, whatever brakes this was, whatever it came off of. My brake shoes that I sent him as a core were not like this. The brake shoe went all the way down here. But you can actually see marks where he like ground, where he put the shoe. So I'm assuming maybe that this is how the original shoe was on whatever Can-Am this came after, came off of. Maybe somebody could tell me out there if, uh, you know, th there was a, a leading shoe and a trailing shoe on some older Can-Ams or different Can-Ams, but I thought it had come off and that um, maybe there was an issue with the adhesion of the brake shoe and I was kind of afraid to put them in. He said, well, you can run them, I'll get your other brake shoes in or relined and then we can swap them out or whatever and he said I can run them. But um, I was kind of concerned that this might come off. But now that I look at it and see that it's ground down, I don't think that's the case. I think these are fine. I don't know if they would work quite as efficiently as the, the other ones missing this chunk of brake shoe, I don't really know. But I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna go ahead and throw them on and maybe I'll have some brakes for the race. Brakes would be nice. Um, there are a few issues with the Can-Am currently um, that I'm dealing with that doesn't, I don't know, maybe other people wouldn't ride it, but there's something wrong in the transmission. I noticed after riding it, one or two times that there was like a grinding sound. I could feel a grinding through the foot peg, mostly the left foot peg, I thought. Um, so I was like, man, there might be something wrong in this transmission. Uh, and I dumped the transmission oil, which I just changed, and there were little shavings of magnesium. I would assume it's magnesium. It wasn't magnetic, um, so it wasn't steel. It could be aluminum, I guess, but I'm kind of feeling like since the cases were made out of magnesium, it's probably magnesium. So I pulled the clutch pack and the Kickstarter and all that stuff off to see. I've had in the past where somebody didn't tighten up the nut on the clutch enough and it was allowing the clutch to kind of wobble back and forth and grind on the cases, but I couldn't find anywhere where anything on the clutch side was grinding on the case. 
So it's probably in the transmission side. Um, I put the clutch back together uh, and, you know, yeah, I rode it again. Obviously, it didn't fix it. It still had it. But the one weird thing is the kind of grinding, vibration, buzzing feeling through the foot pegs isn't constant. It, it like comes and goes a little bit. And I think that may be, I don't know transmissions and Can-Ams that well, but I do know transmissions in general. And usually they're gonna have some kind of washers on the end of the gear sets. And if you don't put those washers in the right place or in the right order, it's possible that the gear might slide and grind on a case if it doesn't have a washer that's supposed to space it away from it. And maybe when I lean the bike a certain direction, the gear walks a little bit and can grind on the case. And then when I tip it back up and tip it the other way, it kind of goes away for a second. So that's kind of where I am. I'm having an issue <laughs> with my backup bike. So I don't really want to uh, ride my backup bike unless I absolutely have to. Um, and I'm just praying that the gear doesn't wear a hole through the bottom of the case um, or lock something up or, you know, just an otherwise just cause the Can-Am not to go. I think I'm gonna have to split the cases regardless, but it's probably, it's not gonna be this weekend, I can tell you that much. So we're just gonna ride it the way it is. I was also gonna change the fork oil and try to slow the rebound down because if these shocks rebound pretty slow, and the front end seems to rebound faster than the shock. So it it's not terrible, but it kind of tends to jump front end high, which maybe old, you know people on older vintage bikes like, but I don't like a bike that is front end high in the air. I tend to like my bike to be pitched more forward. Um, that's just kind of the way I ride. Um, so, but I just kind of decided not to change it because I didn't want to get to the track and if it was really bad or it, it was really doing something considerably different from what I'm used to it doing, then I'm kind of, I don't want to be working on it at the track. So I can't kind of think that I'm just going to leave the fork and then I'll maybe change that in the future, possibly after I split the case. My neighbor's car, it's great, it's super loud. Every morning he starts it at six o'clock in the morning during the week and wakes everybody in the neighborhood up. It's so fast, four cylinder, just, you know, it's a ripper, uh, probably 200 horsepower. So it needs really, really loud exhaust on it, uh, which it does, so kudos to him. Um, but anyways, um, that's kind of where we are. So I guess what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna bring you along and we're gonna rip the brake shoes off really quick and throw the brakes on. Maybe get some gas, start it up and ride it down the street and make sure it stops and see if it stops any better than it did. And if it does, result. If not, I guess I put the old brake shoes back in. I don't know. Um, and then I'm gonna give you kind of a tour of the bike because it's pretty much in its final form. If I do something to the motor, it's not gonna change the outside appearance. I would like to get a I think this is a qualifier side panel, so it's a little redder. You can see the red and the orange. Yeah, there it goes. Race car. Um, so red to orange. Um, I would like to get a stock orange one that's in decent shape, but yeah, this works for now. So what I've seen of this track, um, it's pretty fast and it's hilly and it's kind of sandy. The 250 probably isn't going to be the best bike in the world for that because I'm going to be racing against open bikes because they don't have a 250 class. They have a 250 slash 500 class. So I'm going to be racing against 500s and the 250 Can-Ams, you know, it's going to be some work, um, especially if it like I'm going to race the plus 50 um, GP expert class, which means I'm going to be racing against long travel bikes and you know, newer like 83s, 84s, probably open bikes. So the can is gonna be definitely at a little bit of a disadvantage for that. But uh, if I have brakes, that would be great. I would love to have some brakes. And um, 
hopefully I can just, you know, like try to keep my momentum up and it'll, it'll work okay. But, you know, it may be a bit of a disadvantage. Uh, hopefully, like I said, the transmission doesn't lock up and throw me over the bars and kill me or something like that. And there are some pretty big jumps and I kind of wanted to ride one of my other bikes that had really good suspension so I could try to jump some stuff, but they have some issues too. Every, everything I have has some issues. I'm sorry, it's just the way it is. So here she is, she's all together. I got it cleaned up. It's not, you know, I don't spend a ton of time working on my bikes, trying to make them look pretty. And, you know, it, I mean, it looks pretty nice. Um, I did clean the hubs and everything up and, you know, kind of made it look somewhat presentable, but this is how she looks. Um, maybe I'll flip it around so you can see the other side as well. Here's the other side of the can I mean, I did uh, move the, the camera mount that I made over here on the back so we can uh, get a backward facing view of the camera and hopefully it won't snap off like it did on the fork. But I kind of like having another view on the bike. So that's kind of cool. So let's uh, dig into the brakes, I guess, and see if we can uh, get these brakes swapped out. I got a bit of an elbow problem too to just make it even funner for this race. My elbow on my left arm is all jacked up. I smashed it really hard on my desk. But three weeks ago and it's just not gotten any better but I'm working on it. it sucks getting old that is for sure oh yeah I'm gonna just pull her out like that pull out this and you have this so on this bike you can see there is not a leading shoe um, I mean there is a leading shoe but um, one, they're the, the, the length of the shoes is the same size. I should probably, you know, take the, the cable off it and lube inside here and give it a little, you know, clean, uh, inside here to make it a little uh, easier to move, but I really just don't have the time or the want to today because I really wasn't planning on working on my back today. Today was supposed to be a travel day. So, um, yeah, it is what it is. Um, I guess I'm gonna just try to clean this up a little bit. Maybe put just a little bit of brake grease on here. And then uh, slap it back together. So oh, my camera's turning off every 10 minutes, which is excellent because that's going to be one of my, it's what I'm using at the track to video. So I'll probably have 10 minutes of footage and then it'll turn off. So that's gonna be great. What I understand, since my shoe didn't have a leading and a trailing, I wasn't a, a little 100% unsure. I know the old drum brake systems in cars work the same. So from what I understand, if I'm wrong, maybe they're gonna work like crap, but the big shoe goes on the back side, considering the rotation. So I put the big shoe on this side, which ends up being the back side when the wheel's on. So that's what I'm going with. Hopefully that's right. Um, I don't know if it is. There's only one way to find out, I guess, if it grinds or it doesn't work. Um, so let's uh, put her back on and then we'll see if this camera turns off 10 minutes, which it probably will. That'll be great. This is gonna be fun because I don't have a very good angle of the dangle to do anything on this thing now, but Wow. Huh. So, 
brake shoes. I guess I need to adjust her out because it was they were so worn out that uh, yeah, the, the brake's kind of on all the time with these shoes. It, I, the brakes I took off it don't really look a ton worn out compared to these. They're really glazed, but um, apparently they are, so I really need to back the screw off a whole bunch to get that to go down. Maybe that'll hold it, maybe. Shoes were pretty worn out. Hopefully these brake shoes will fit in here. If not, then I did all this for no reason and that's gonna suck. down the street and the brakes actually work not great not nearly as good as a double leading shoe but they actually cause the front end to dive a little bit when you get on them with all four fingers she's a four finger breaker for sure and I cut my my knuckle so I don't want to be bashing the brake lever off that knuckle so it's four finger breaking for me this weekend but yeah they worked so result on that so we have brakes that work we still have I could still feel the Weird thing going on in the engine, but it is what it is. The clutch may be slipping just a little bit too, which I didn't take the clutch back apart. I just left it the way it was. It didn't look bad. It engages good, but I've noticed sometimes that it seems like it's slipping a little bit. So I don't know, maybe it needs clutch too, but we're just gonna run it the way it is 
it moves. So that's all that matters. And we have a front brake, which is a big result for me. And we're going to get the trailer down. I, I built this, uh, I'll show it to you. I built this winch system for my trailer because this trailer is pretty heavy with all the stuff on it and you have to tilt it up. So what I did is I uh, mounted this plank to the studs and mounted a 110 winch from Harbor Freight on there that hooks into that uh, bolt. Now, believe it or not, there's a little safety catch on that bolt and the last time we got the trailer down, you have to tilt it a little bit to get the, um, for it to tilt so it gets some tension on the, the cable. So it'll just kind of lean there. So you have to kind of pull it off its balance point. And somehow when I loosened up the cable enough to be able to get to tip it, it was just gave itself just the right thing and it managed to push that little spring den detent down and just pop it out. So when I started pulling it down, I'm like, man, this is getting pretty heavy. And then right at the last second, I went, ah, and I pushed it back up and I looked and the, the cable was just dangling. So I was just like, oh. So I almost kind of flattened myself. I mean, the trailer weighs about 250 pounds is about, I put a, a weight thing on it to see how much of a load the winch was taking. It's around 250, 260 pounds. Um, me and my girlfriend could lift it up and push it up into that position, but just barely. And it would do this weird thing where it transitions for the, from the road wheels to the bogey wheels. It would sometimes slide and then it would be skittering across the floor and you'd be like, Oh, trying to hold on to it. So it's, it was kind of sketch and it was hard and it was a lot of effort. This is a little sketch too. I'll show you how I do it, but it's, it's better than having to do it the old fashioned way of just muscling it. So I'll kind of show you how, how I do it and you know, what happened uh, the first time I did it. Um, so, and uh, thanks to my father-in-law, Glenn, he helped me kind of design it and, and figure it out. And um, he was a lot of help with that. So I, I think we got a system that works. It's not perfect, but I'll show you how it works here in a second. So kind of the first step in this process is to, uh, I gotta get the extension cord, which is of course, everything's on top of. So. I know it doesn't move. Okay. So plug that in. So I got a little stick. Grab on to my winch line. And of course, this is behind that. So, go like this. Give myself a little slack. That's probably broken now. Pull it out the wall a little bit. Need to. right tell right about there it's kind of centered and see uh, so these wood pieces have a hole drilled in them and I put some bolts down here on the bottom I'm sure you can't see that I'll, I'll show you um, well let me get one on and then I'll kind of show you what I'm doing <laughs> So these wood pieces go to a bolt that I put down here on my trailer. Of course now I can't see it because my camera turned off. But down here, then this just goes on like that. Then you go like this and you push it up against the wall. Because what happens is when it transitions from these little wheels down here to the big wheel here, there's a moment where it's gonna slide. And as I let it down, it's gonna pull it away from the wall a little bit, not a long ways, but a little bit, about this much. And then when it gets down to these wheel, it starts that transition, it's gonna slide back. And what these do is they catch it on the wall so you don't put holes in your wall. That was a lesson learned the first time we did it. Well, we actually did it 
twice and put two sets of holes in all. But um, yeah, there's just this transition. You gotta be careful over here too that you don't miss the wall because if it misses the wall, then you got problems as well. So make sure that's against that. And then on to the next step that almost killed me last time. What I do now is I have a little slack and it's lined up. I need to, probably even a little more slack than that. I need to get enough slack where I can tip it to me and hopefully it doesn't come unhooked like it did last time. And I can understand why it did. I think you want to have it like that. That way it can't uh, kind of snake back on itself, I hope. Hopefully it doesn't move, but what you need to do is tilt that.
Uh, so here I am at the start of my second moto at Shorty's. Um, unfortunately, that my camera either decided not to work or shut off or didn't record or something happened, but I didn't get any footage from my first race. My first race was a GP2 uh, 250 500 expert. Um, I was the only person in that particular class. Actually, both my classes, I was the only person in it. Um, but the first moto, um, since I don't have any footage, I'll kind of tell you what happened. Uh, I got the whole shot pretty clean, probably my best start of the whole day. I was out front, controlled it pretty much from the get go, had the inside going into the first corner. Um, you'll see coming up, there's like a Kind of a double kind of thing and then a big single and when i hit the big single and this has never happened on my can-am but it happened this time i got a false neutral and and on the uh takeoff of the jump it shifted into a false neutral and i went over the bar almost went completely over the front of the bike i actually hit the bar so hard that i bruised uh the front of my thighs on both sides way up by my hip um, so I lost all my drive. This guy on 125 kind of passed me on the outside. I just slammed it into gear. And then I was kind of all upset because I gave the start away. And there's like a, a right-hander and a few. But there gets to be this long straightaway. I'll kind of show it when we get there. But there's a straightaway. And I tried to go up the inside of him. And I was coming pretty hard. And I thought he was going to go outside. And I ended up... Uh, was going to pass him on the inside and he kind of moved over it wasn't his fault he didn't know I was there but when he did that I was coming so fast I had no place to go so I had two options I could run into him knock him down or knock me down or knock us both down somebody might get hurt that wasn't a good option so I basically just pulled to the left and tried to miss him and I knew it was really soft and I lost the front I crashed when I crashed I had broke my fender it, it, it kind of almost didn't break it break it it's just like folded it straight up so my fender was pointed straight up it was a split gate so i was on the first gate and there was a second gate and i was off the track trying to beat my fender back down into some form of down and the whole second gate got by me as well so by the time i got going i was a dead last i you know just kind of rode like a pissed off teenager and I, I mean I passed people but I really have no idea exactly where I finished because I was in dead last to start so that was kind of my first moto um you know I had a good start and that and I got one false neutral now you're going to see in the top left corner yeah the reason there is a um I have my false neutral counter and it's already at one because I already had one and it was actually the worst one to be honest but I have more it's never fun to get a false neutral ever on a bike, um, but you know, it's better if you don't crash. So I didn't crash in any of them, just bruised, bruised myself a little bit. But so this class is my plus 50 GP expert um, class. I'm the only person in this class, in this class as well, um, but I am racing against some long travel bikes. I actually have uh, two CR 480s on my left, one of them is right next to me is ridden by Richard, a uh, guy I know from uh, Tucson, shout out Richard. And then on my right, I have another CR480 and then like a TT500 or something like that. Um, so I haven't done a rubber band start in, since the 90s in Montana. So um, I think I was not, I probably should have been going off his foot but I just didn't get some good jumps sometimes. I mean, usually right against the post is the best place to be when you're doing a rubber band start, but my jumps weren't very good. And as you're gonna see right here, you're, you're gonna see. Now, basically what I did on this start is I just hoped that Richard was gonna break before I would and give me some room because I really didn't have the start. I was kind of sandwiched in between two CR480s but uh, you'll see it, kind of what happened with that. Uh, point at everybody. Uh, Richard's up on the inside. You can see his front there. Um, he's going to get a pretty good jump off me, on me.
but he does kind of shut off a little early, so I'm able to kind of sneak up the inside and get the whole shot. Uh, this jump right here is where I hit the false neutral in the first moto and almost went over the bars. Um, and I'll show you, this is the straightaway where I tried I tried to go up the inside of this corner to pass the guy in the first moto and just ran out of space and got off into this really soft stuff. Um, my lines kind of change as it gets rougher. track it's pretty flowy I try to stand up as much as I can uh, it's not too rough yet um, it's pretty fast it doesn't look it but th this section right here this straightaway I mean you're getting into fourth um, and you might even be able to hear it here I don't know there it, when I mess my fender up it actually sometimes bottoms right there and you can hear it rub on the front tire I had a pretty good line right here where I would jump up on the top of this and then like pre-jump down into the bottom. And I didn't really, I don't know if anybody else was doing it, but the little, it was like a little bump before you would jump down in. And uh, um, it would uh, save quite a bit of time because you wouldn't jump so far off of it. Um, so we're coming around to the end of the first lap right now. I don't know if I missed any gears, but I, I'm not going to concentrate on the missed gears at this point. Um, I'll put a, I'll, I'll count them as I go, but I, I don't think I had a missed gear up until I think I have one coming up here pretty soon. It did take me a while to learn this track. I didn't walk it the night before, and I just basically rode whatever three laps of practice or whatever and called it good. But I really like this section right here later on in, in, in the day. You're going to see that I'm going way outside, shifting down a third, standing up and reeling around this outside, and it actually carrying quite a bit of momentum. I think I missed a shift here. Yeah, land off that, no drive whatsoever. Um, you hear me yell at it, telling it to stop. Like, the, the bike can hear me and tell it to stop uh, misshifting. But it's, it's not much fun when you land off a, you know, land off something and you expect it to be pulling you forward and then all of a sudden uh, you have zero forward momentum. So. kind of see I kind of missed that line um, like I said this is part where I could like pre-jump here get up on top and then jump right there and jump down in the bottom sometimes I did it better than others uh, this was a pretty sandy corner um, obviously it's pretty fast so that the, the 250 is uh, you know, not ideal I guess an open mic would have been a little better but um, at least it's light, and it does put the power down pretty well, so. Some of these jumps, if I was on one of my longer travel bikes, I think I would have probably done that tabletop, especially if I would have had my 300 to practice on the track so I could get the speeds down. Um, and there gets to be a pretty good kicker in there. The track does get fairly rough, and it, it starts drying out pretty good. I mean, this is my second motor of the day, but it's still in the morning, so... Still not hitting that section the way I was hitting it later in the day, but still kind of working. Sorry about the camera angle. I know it's pointed down just a little bit too much, especially when I'm standing. Uh, oh, and my camera mount thing. Uh, 
it broke off in practice of course the camera broke off i think i over tightened it and it broke the plastic piece that went in between my mount and the gopro and i just kind of was it i didn't realize that i was going to be kicking it when i would throw my leg over so it just it's going to have to be re-engineered so this is the only view i have unfortunately but it is what it is yeah this if you could hear it there but Yes, every once in a while it'll grind. That's a pretty fun section of the track. much better i didn't notice that i was not four finger breaking i was only two finger breaking i don't really make it any kind of conscious thing about that when i just start riding i just start riding and whatever happens happens but i didn't notice that i was not using four fingers on the brake i was only using two um, if anybody knows about can-ams hitting false neutrals uh please let me know i assume it's probably you know, possibly whatever's wrong with the transmission with the grinding in the, in the cases. It might, may give it some extra space, and it, there can be a false neutral in there, but I don't really know at this point. But if someone knows about false neutrals in k -Naps, I think I got one right now. I don't know if that was one, too. I'll have to. It's kind of hard to trying to listen to it and, and talk at the same time. Maybe it's annoying. I guess I'll just be quiet.
I'm kind of taking it a little easy here at the end of the last lap because uh, I'm, I have two more races in between and then I have to race again. So I was just trying to save a little energy, but it went pretty well. Um, A&M's running well besides the mischiefs. And, uh, uh, yeah, I love this track. It's just a ton of fun. It was, a, it was just a great day all around. So this is actually my second moto of the moto that I missed recording in the morning. So this, it was my GP2 um, expert race, uh, 250 expert race. There is a CR480 in here on my right. Um, there's a CR125 on my left. And like a, a, like a big bore, you know, 75 Mako or something, mid 70s Mako on my left as well, I think. Now, the guy on my left on the 125, this guy is fast. I mean, he, I think he's in the, rides in the plus 65, I mean, plus 60 group, so props to anyone that's in their 60s and 70s still racing, let alone going fast. So that 125 is not slow. You're going to see, I mean, in the first moto, I did whole shotting, but in this one, I, I do not. And I kind of, at this point in the day, kind of started mellowing out a little bit. It was just like, all right, just let it come to you. If you don't get the start, don't worry about it. Don't do anything stupid at the beginning of the race. Just kind of hang out and see how it's going to go. So, um, but they definitely, that 125 is fast. And both of these guys that are out in front of me on this one are better. And they're good riders, for sure. So, um, let's go ahead and... Uh, start this one off with my not greatest start in the world, but uh, it could have been worse. He just stomps his foot. I think I should have been timing it off this foot stomp, but there's the guy on the 125 on the inside. That thing is fast, and he is a good rider. And then there's that, uh, I don't know what it is. I can't really tell. Maybe it's a Montessa, but both of these guys are very quick. Um, and I didn't really get a ride up front in the first moto because I crashed, obviously. So, but I have a little better lines, I think. Uh, this line, this outside line, is working better. The track's getting a little rougher. I'm pretty sure I have a mission. 
still in the CR480 sandwich between like three of them. I get a decent jump, but uh, I think that's Kyle Kenyon on the inside on a CR480. I believe that guy's plus 70, if you could believe that. If I could be riding a CR480 at plus 70, that guy's the man. I just kind of come up inside a little bit. I didn't want to get into him here, but I was pretty sure my outside line in this corner was going to be faster, so I just came down the outside, shifted down into food, and railed around this pretty good and got on the gas and it worked out so i was able to uh but i think i have a miss shift coming up here if you'll hear this one so i think i like leave it in fourth log shift neutral somehow from fourth and then maybe in the second i have no idea how you go from fourth to second but it literally, it, it's false neutrals because I was in fourth. I shifted down into a false neutral and then was in like second. So I don't know what's going on with the transmission at this point, but I'm just trying to make sure I'm shifting a little bit earlier and not revving it quite so much to try to make sure that it's going into gear better. I think that's probably the last miss shift I have in a race. Over jump that you can see I missed the pre jump a little bit and ended up jumping quite a ways down into the bottom. But um, my lines are even though the track is, is the roughest it's going to get, I feel my lines are the best in this moto. I bet you if I did the lap time, I bet you my lap times were the best in this moto compared to any of the other motos in there during the day because my lines were just better. I was just riding around the bumps better. I wasn't um, coming out in the wrong gears as much. Um, kind of knew where I was going and knew the track really well. I started to ride around bumps like that bump right there on the inside was pretty heavy. But like this, you know, I'm hitting the line pretty well and able to get on the gas. So just uh, finally starting to really remember the track well and uh, having a good flow. So the track is definitely slick. I think, like right here, you can kind of see I lost the back end on that coming up. But uh, this this line is so much fun. I don't really look very fast, but it, it saves you so much time because there was so many bumps on that top of that tabletop with people landing on it and accelerating that I was able to like jump over those acceleration bumps, and it was saving me a ton of time. Um, so at this point, I, I'm really feeling pretty good with the, the Can-Am. I know what it's going to do. I'm going to have breaks. Um, I'm just out having fun. It's a great day on a Sunday. And I love racing so much. I mean, I can't even put it into words. I know people might look at this and say, well, it's so slow. And, but it's just so much fun. I love vintage racing. I love any kind of racing. But vintage racing is just so much fun. Um, go out and do and it you know it's i don't know motocross is just so much fun I, I i love it so much when i watch this footage if i just allow myself to look and see how much fun i'm having i'm just like in the flow i don't think about anything i'm i'm not you know when i race i'm like completely in the zone i have never really if I'm doing it right, I'm never daydreaming, I'm never thinking about anything, I'm just like, hit remarks, hit remarks, hit remarks, and that's, you know, kind of the, the way I try to ride, I just don't think about anything, and just go, I mean, like, it's definitely getting rough and choppy at this point, but I, I mean, I, I, I'm having a lot of fun, it's such a beautiful day, it's not too hot, the track's pretty fast, um, and, you know, the it's working great, so I, I don't have any complaints besides the false neutrals, which, uh, it, admittedly, if they happened in the wrong place, I could have gotten hurt. And, you know, the boost thighs could have been better, but uh, still just having an absolute blast out racing. And I love that there's so many guys that are just going for it in their 60s and 70s. It gives me so much inspiration to keep racing and, you know... I just feel like, ooh, I really messed that corner up right there, got off into the soft spot, pushed the front, and almost crashed. But, um, yeah, even then, still, still a great time and having fun.
and the camera just doesn't do the hills any justice on this track on how steep the hills are, how big they are, everything looks really flat, but it's actually, some of those hills are really steep, um, so it, it's, it's a lot of fun. Like, the, this, this first one's pretty steep and then it flattens out when you come go over the top and you go down into this one. You hear my, my front tire hit the fender, that's because it's bottomed out, that's how steep it is. It's, you're really compressing going up that, so, just a lot of fun. I really like, did like this track. So many vintage tracks are really flat and set up for like, the early 70s bikes or uh, what I like about this track is you can ride it jump stuff but it, what if you didn't jump stuff there was still a flow to it and I you know I just love that about this track you can find a flow in it I think this is the last lap yeah check your flag so here we go I'm gonna let this run so I, I'm pretty tired it's fourth motor of the day coming in, you know, shift down into first, I kind of have to ride behind our pit, and I, I honestly, you'll see me when I come around the corner, I literally just, I'm looking at my stand, I'm not looking at the fence, so I kind of come in and come in a little wide, because this is kind of a 90, the fence is right there, I just kind of come in, I get wide, I'm looking at my stand, oh, there's my stand, not looking at the fence at all, wham! Right into the fence. That hurt. And it did hurt. That didn't feel good at all. I mean, that ground is Ouch. very, very hard. So it's the next weekend. Um, man, I had just a ton of fun at that race. I really, really liked that track. Uh, it was a lot of fun. The Can-Am held in there. Didn't blow up. I mean, the, the seat cover started coming apart. She's going to need a new seat cover. I haven't really checked. The bars may be kind of askew from the smacking of the the fence um but otherwise i mean it's it ran good um i was pretty happy with everything and how the day went a little bruised up but that's okay um but now i was uh going to the plan is just to drain the transmission oil and use one of those paint strainers and see what comes out um just to see you know What's going on? The false neutral, like I said, was never an issue at the other tracks that I rode it at. Granted, they weren't very fast. Maybe I wasn't, well, I don't know if I ever got out of third gear, maybe once or twice, but I certainly wasn't going wide open throttle the way I was on that track. I don't know if that had something to do with it or, I mean, if something new was popping up or what's going on, but the false neutral, thing wasn't fun. I mean, it's scary when you get a false neutral. It's not really scary. You can't see it coming, but I mean, it's just, you know, it sucks when you almost go over the bars because you're holding, you're, you're bracing for that acceleration. So you're really holding yourself. You're ready to hold yourself forward to keep your, you know, head over the bars. And then all of a sudden there's no drive and you basically just launch yourself over. Um, and then also when it hits the ground, it, you know, it, the momentum just stops. So you add those two things together, momentum stopping, and then you being braced to hold yourself back and there's no resistance and you just, you know, smack up against the bar. So, um, you know, it is what it is. I'm de it's definitely I need to get uh, something I need to get fixed. And I, I'm gonna, I have a plan that I'm gonna share with you that I'm probably gonna do. I haven't quite figured it out yet, but let's go ahead and drain the oil, see what that looks like, and then we'll go from there. So we're down here, we're gonna look at the drain plug. There is one little uh, thing that, you know, is unique to Can-Ams. Also, some other bikes have a similar kind of thing, but there is two drain plugs where oil will come out on the bottom of a Can-Am, and there's one you don't wanna remove because one of them holds the preload on the kickstart spring. And if you pull that drain plug, you lose that um, preload on the kickstart spring and your kickstarter's not gonna work properly. I don't know if you remember all the way back to my other bike, the way the Kickstarter was sticking down. I believe that is why that is sticking down is because the, the it's lost the preload on the spring. Um, 
So I'll show you here really quick. So you come down here, you can see uh, if this wasn't in shadow. Um, this is the, the preload detent spring. You do not want to remove the one that looks like a bolt. You want to remove this Allen head here. This one, that's the drain plug. This one that looks like a bolt, you do not want to remove. That is actually what holds the preload on your Kickstarter spring inside the case. So never take this one out. Maybe take a little something and say do not remove or something on that, but um, you don't want to take that out. Uh, ask me how I know. So my hope is I can kind of loosen this drain bolt and hold this funnel under there and kind of, I don't know how fast the oil is going to go through this paint strainer, but my hope is I can kind of do this. I want to get a bunch of dirt in there. That is it from the motor. I want to try to keep it as clean as you can because you don't want stuff that actually isn't part of the engine. You know, the motor. Why is this coming out so hard? Apparently the threads in this thing are not so good. I have no idea how far I can thread it before it starts coming loose. <laughs> that seems dangerously close to falling out. And then if I don't have my funnel thingy under there, it's not going to work. Okay. Let's see here what I can do. Oh, that's going to not overflow, it doesn't look like. No, it doesn't look like it's going to overflow, so... It does look like maybe some of the particles are coming through though. I can see some shiny. Oh, yeah. I mean, the drain plug is apparently magnetic. She's a little hairy. So it was definitely making some metal this time that it was not making last time because it wasn't making any metal shavings before that I could see. I don't know if you can see this at all, but I'll leave this out. Before. We'll get a close-up of it for you. It's definitely making some metal now. I don't know. I assume that's probably from the mist shifts, not... So that's a new development. Not the case rubbing, I don't think. You can kind of see, I kind of poked up the metal a little bit on the magnetic end, so you can kind of see how much there is. That's a lot for four motos, I can tell you that much. Should not be looking like that on the end of the magnetic drain plug. Um, so there's some pretty big chunks, unfortunately, which means I probably may have done some damage to some of the gears, which really sucks. Um, Cause then I won't know, hey, do I need to, do I need to, you know, get new gears or what I'm gonna have to do, so. I don't know, we're gonna have to pull it apart and see on that. Let me uh, pull the funnel apart and see if there's a bunch of magnesium in there or not, or what we're looking at on that side. So I'm not really seeing much in this filter as far as like magnesium chunks. So I don't know if it maybe uh, went ahead and clearanced itself inside the cases. Um, and it wasn't hitting that much. Possibly some of the chunks were getting through this. I don't know if you'll be able to see this on camera or not, but there's definitely a lot of glitter. And this is not magnetic. This is, um... This is uh, definitely magnesium or aluminum. There's definitely a lot of glitter in this. So what I'm doing with a Can-Am going forward is more a component of uh, racing vintage nationals than anything else. 
So I have that. It, it is a, I believe a GP bike, a twin shock bike, but, and it's a 250. So if I rode it in the Ad Vintage Nationals in the GP uh, 250 class, I could, but I would have to have a backup for that bike. And the only backup that I have for this particular bike would be the other Can-Am. And the problem with that is I need about a thousand dollars in parts for that Can-Am to get it going. I need rims, I need forks, I need triple clamps. I mean, everything that was broken on this bike, I stole from the other bike. So I have to replace all that. And I, it's just not in the budget to spend a thousand bucks, you know, around that, you know, and I may have to rebuild the motor. I don't know, it's, it's kind of up in the air, but this one definitely has a bad motor. So I would have to split the case on this, maybe buy transmission gears, what I'm gonna, what I'm gonna have to do to fix that. So kind of my thought is, is the other Can-Am, the motor has compression. It's not super great, but it, it has decent compression. It was like 150 pounds, I think, if I remember right. Uh, it does have the issue with the Kickstarter with that pre, I, I'm pretty sure it's just the preload has been taken off the Kickstarter. So I need to pull the clutch off fix the preload on the, the Kickstarter or whatever is wrong with the Kickstarter. Um, but I think I can take that motor and put it in this bike. Then I have hopefully a bike that shifts and runs okay. If it is a little down on power, I could always take the top end off this bike and put it on that engine, uh, which wouldn't be very difficult. It would be pretty cheap as well. So that is, probably my plan is I'm going to get the engine out of the other Can-Am, fix the, the kickstart spring, put it in this bike, probably put my Olins back on it to see if they're gonna stick again, go take it to the track, ride it, see how it works. If the engine runs good, or at least pretty good, um, result, I'm just gonna leave it that way. Um, if the engine isn't strong, I might end up putting the top end off this bike on that engine, or yeah, I don't know exactly what's gonna go on. And also if the shocks are still sticking, then I will put these shocks back on it and try to figure out what's going on with the shocks. So moving forward, you're not probably gonna see the Can-Am for a bit because I'm going to be moving into the other bikes that I've kind of decided that are gonna be my uh, Vintage National Bikes, which also have some issues that I have to get to work on right away because the first race I'm gonna race in Vintage Nationals is the 5th of May. It's, you know, the end of March. So I don't have very much time and I got bikes that are need work. So I gotta do an engine swap on this and I gotta do some other work on the other bikes. That's coming up. So then you've probably seen some other bikes in the background. I don't think it's really a secret, but now coming up, moving forward in the channel, it's gonna be more about those bikes, at least until I actually get to the Vintage Nationals. And then there may be, I'm definitely gonna have some more Can-Am stuff, doing the motor swap, fixing the Kickstarter, um, seeing how that works. There will be an episode coming up on that. But um, my thought is I'm gonna be riding the Ultima class at the Vintage Nationals, which is more of a single shock bike class because if I did uh, Ultima 500, the advantage it gives me is I can ride this bike in that class if I had to, because it's not too big. I can always ride a smaller engine in the open class. You can't ride an open bike in a 250 class. So if I needed to use the Can-Am as a backup for my 465 in that particular class, I could and or one of the other 250s that I have, I could. And then I'm gonna ride a plus 50 expert class that's just like an open post vintage plus 50 expert class. Then I can ride any bike in that one as well. So it just gives me more flexibility with the bikes that I have. If one of them's breaking down or whatever, I can just move them around and I'm always gonna have a backup because these bikes are not $9,000, strip them to every nut and bolt, replate everything, make sure everything's within tolerances, everything's brand new, every new OEM part, $10,000 build. That is not these bikes, it's just not, it's not what I do. Um, I want a bike that's dependable and 
It, but you know, they're gonna break because they're old and they're gonna break. And I'm not going through every little nut and bolt on them because that's just not, I, I like a bike that I don't have to worry about scratching or denting or whatever, you know? I don't want something that's too pretty. I, I like them like this, a little crusty, but hopefully reliable. But my thought is I'm gonna have three bikes that I can use and I should be able to plug any of those three bikes to ride any of the classes that I ride if I ride Ultima, Open, and 50 plus uh, Post Vintage. If I ride those two classes, I should be able to ride any of my bikes in either of those classes. So uh, it gives me a lot of options as far as, hey, this bike's better at this track or this bike's better at that track. It just gives me options that I won't have to be like stuck with riding just one bike. The one drawback, well, you're lugging three bikes around with you probably most of the season. Um, gas mileage, you know, Patty, you know, she's four in a row ready to tow, but she isn't exactly a super powerhouse. Um, I think I was only, I need to get a better idea because I didn't get a full on uh, mile per gallon because I had some on a, tank before, but I think I was only getting low 20s uh, pulling two bikes and all the stuff I had with me, um, which people might say, oh, that's a four cylinder car, that's terrible, but it's probably comparable or even better than most people driving a truck. Plus, during the week, I don't have to drive a truck. I get 34 miles to the gallon driving around town. So, you know, to me, it just makes sense to use that even though it doesn't get great gas mileage to go on the long trips, overall, um, it saves me money because I don't have every day when I'm doing it as a daily driver, I'm not getting 20 miles to the gallon when I'm driving in traffic. So that's kind of how I'm looking at it. Hopefully, you know, I put a transmission cooler on it, which yeah, a transmission cooler on a Saturn. Yeah, not a lot of people rocking those, but I'm like, I want to keep the transmission cool um, and I've never had it overheat, but I haven't done, I mean, I went to Portland with two bikes on a trailer and I did three bikes from California, but not a lot of hills or passes or anything, but I don't think there's gonna be much passes or hills that I'm gonna have to go up. So hopefully that works out good, but that's kind of where I am right now. I'm kind of rambling on, but um, coming up is gonna be new bikes on the channel for at least a month or however long, I don't know how it's gonna go. I don't even remember, it's been so long. I mean, I shot most of the footage on the new bikes four to six months ago, so I don't even know what I got. So I don't know how many episodes it's gonna be, but I'll bring you along, we'll get you up to speed, and then hopefully in May, um, we're gonna have some bikes, I don't know which one. There's gonna be a yellow and an orange, and I don't know which ones I'm gonna be racing, but my hope is that I stay healthy, stay off the ground, the bikes stay in one piece, and I can uh, make it through this season 